Well, welcome in everybody. I know some of you are probably still finishing dinner or multitasking in your own homes. And so that's fine. We understand if you don't have your video on that you're probably multitasking. And hopefully maybe relaxing a little bit. Maybe your children are in bed or at least in that general direction and you're free to have some adult time. So tonight, um, we're looking forward to sharing with you the things that we love. And um, that's definitely the title of this topic of this presentation tonight, Drawing Upon the Mathematical Mind. And I'm going to introduce my co-presenters tonight, and then Lakeisha with some housekeeping tasks. And um, uh, while Lakeisha's doing that, the fun thing is going to be, I'm going to actually jog down the hallway because there are no children in the building. I get to run in the building and then pick up inside a classroom and give you a little sneak peek inside one of our children's house classrooms this year and um, start off with a little bit of orientation to the mathematical, mathematical mind and um, the sensorial introduction to math. And I'm sorry, I realize I'm a little bit in the shadow here, but I won't be on the screen very long. And um, so I'd like to, I think maybe you all uh, already know these guides, but just in case, Karen Hannon DeWalt, Karen, wave your hands, they see you there. And Jane Koth, uh, up there on the top from my screen. And Karen and Jane are one of our many children's house AMI trained guides. And I could boast about them forever. They have uh, great years of experience observing children and observing their mathematical mind and capacity emerging and knowing when to move each child on individually at their own pace. And, um, but the AMI training that they have helps all of our children's house guides. So what you hear tonight is true in every single children's house classroom. Um, because our training, that Association Montessori International training, um, really roots us all in very clear understanding of the psychology of learning, a very clear understanding of the developmental needs, and a very clear understanding of when and how to introduce children to each new concept in math. And this is Karen Hannon DeWalt's math album, this big binder. So we all have these binders that we had to make in our own hands as part of our training. And whether you take your training in Ireland or in Japan or in America, we all are rooted in the same um, math albums. And um, they're kind of like a, a big book of lesson plans and theory and um, tell us what the points of interest and what the control of error is for each presentation and each exercise the child, um, we, we gift to the child. And uh, so with that being said, our introduction's over. Tonight, we're going to um, do three short presentations. I'll do one in uh, one of the classrooms in one second. And then Karen, uh, will, will, yes, Karen comes next and she'll do a short presentation. And then Jane will finish the presentations and then we'll open it up for the last 15 minutes of dialogue and conversation and questions. Um, and um, I think that completes my orientation because Lakeisha is going to do um, some housekeeping while I move down the hallway to the classroom. I'll see you there. Okay, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to let you all know that we are recording this session and we will follow up and send an email out to um, attendees and all um, families who weren't able to attend along with any resources that were shared. Uh, and then also to get the um, full benefit of tonight's session, you may want to ch uh, change your setting up in the top to the speaker view uh, that you can um, see the full screen as they share some of the materials. Thank you. Thank you, Lakeisha, for the housekeeping. And uh, I am now in a children's house uh, classroom. And because none of our parents have been able to come in the building this year, um, I thought I'd give you a, just a little walkabout. I hope this doesn't make you dizzy. But um, 
if you remember, if your child was enrolled in prior years, you'll remember that, you know, the little individual tables, lots of space for movement, shelves full of materials that children are free to choose at any time, all prepared for them. A couple of differences this year. You'll notice that each child has their own little tote and they have designated tables with their photograph on it and their name. That would be different from pre-COVID and post-COVID, but, um, but the classrooms are still beautiful and all the materials are still set out. We just um, have to do a lot of sanitizing between, between use. And so we, here we are in the math area. This happens to be Johan's prepared environment. And I will start with a little bit of uh, theory behind um, how we draw upon the mathematical mind because we're all born with the capacity for mathematical interests and um, the mathematical reasoning. And Dr. Montessori calls those innate capacities the human tendencies. These are kind of uh, needs and capacities that every human has had throughout time, uh, throughout history of mankind, in every culture, in every type of environment, all humans have these tendencies, these needs and capacities, if you will. And um, they include order, orientation, exploration, manipulation, repetition, which is kind of a self-perfection to challenge oneself, abstraction, and communication of one's ideas. There are many more human tendencies, but these are the ones I'm highlighting tonight because these are the ones that directly speak to the development of the mathematical mind. And we have these human tendencies as humans through time and space to understand the environment, to become independent within it, and to further create within it to better meet our needs as humans. So availing of these natural tendencies and interests that peak at different ages and stages of development to draw upon their natural interests and needs of each child, Children's House begins with the sensorial exploration. And I'm just going to move this camera, so I'm sorry if it's a little bit bumpy because this is our first time trying to do this live. <laughs> but there are indirect preparations. So even the three-year-old or two and a half-year-old coming into Montessori Children's House starts to do, um, to really um, bring out a conscious awareness, things that were subconscious before three become a conscious awareness of um, mathematical concepts. So these sensorial materials whoops, um, indirectly are um, preparing the mathematical mind. Many of you would know this. If you, took off your, if you took off your mics, I bet you could all call out the answer. This is a pink tower. And it is um, base 10, the lowest, the, the largest cube at the bottom is 10 centimeters squared, and it um, diminishes in size and dimension by one centimeter precisely till it gets to the very smallest one centimeter cube at the top. And it calls the young child to be very precise in their movements and to be able to get things superimposed just perfectly. And the angles and the corners are very carefully kept to be true mathematical angles, not chipped away and rounded. <laughs> and the sensorial material, much of it is base 10. We don't tell them this, they just absorb it. This is a cylinder block. And you'll see that, you know, there are 10 cylinders. And in this case, the, the gradation and differentiation is height and breadth. Once the child has had lots of sensorial exploration with lots of interesting materials that engage their senses, their hands, their skin, their bodies, their muscles, and they understand how to grade things according to particular qualities, the teacher times just right when to show them the math, the first math material, which here is our number rods. And the number rods are sensorial. You can physically carry them all the way to a mat and then you learn the movements of how to count. This is fixed number. It's different than counting separate units, but fixed number is an easy way to start. You start with just one step at a time in math. In this case, fixed numerals, one, two, three. Simultaneously, they're learning through their senses, through tracing with their skin and their hands, numerals. And again, this is really just language, just like the language of one, two, three, 
This is the language. This is the word for this symbol, one, and this symbol, two. You can see here they're in plastic envelopes because we can sanitize them better, but they can still feel through the plastic. So once you have those numbers, zero through nine, you can do any operation in the world, no matter how large the, de the denomination or the category, they can be doing multiplication and division into the hundreds of thousands. All you need is zero to nine and an introduction to the great power of 10. Very sensorial based, very language oriented, learning those symbols. And all you need is zero to nine to start working with the decimal system. And this decimal system, you may already be familiar. In this case, they're beautiful, shiny glass beads. And the unit is this little golden one unit. And 10 of those units all pushed together will give you a 10. And then 10 of those tens all sliding together makes a square that we call a hundred. And the hundred is kind of getting heavier and bigger than a 10 and much a hundred times those little units. It's 10 times those tens. And 10 of these hundreds builds this very big, heavy, important cube. We call that a thousand. So you can see it's so sensorial and it's language the names of these categories. Remember, they already now know numbers zero to nine, so they can move on with great ease to, after the sensorial introduction, to the symbol of those units and counting one unit, two units, three units, four units, until they get to nine units. And then they know from their bodies, they know from holding in their hands that once they get to 10 units, oh, that's the same as a 10. So we can go up here and count the tens, one ten, two tens, three tens, and so on till we get to nine tens. And then they know in their bodies from feeling in their hands that 10 tens all together, that's the same as a hundred. Well, here's the symbol for 100. And they count on, they understand the order and the layout of then comes the hundreds and then comes the thousands. So in this material, the decimal bead material, we, 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 stay, we stop at thousands, but later they can actually go into the millions. Once we have that understanding of the concrete experience of, of the decimal system and how to communicate it in, in number instead of in words, then the fun really begins because now they can start doing collective work with friends. They can do paired work or shared group, small group work. And they learn a game of what we call, some people call the bank or the store. And they get these trays and the adult or another child will give them a big number to remember. And walk all the way around the room, get over to that shelf and bring back 3,500s, six tens and four units. And they go to the shelf and they count out. In this case now, the thousands are actually representational because they're wood. So they're getting more abstract. They're no longer all the glass beads. They count out their quantity, they bring it back. And maybe we're doing multiplication today. So maybe every child gets to bring the same number and they have to bring it five times. Well, let's add all that together. How much each of you brought 3,500, and this is the beauty of this work, and 64, they learn to read that big number. They're very impressed with big numbers, it makes them feel very important. And if you take that five times, now how much do we have? And so there's lots of counting and exchanging. When you get to 10 units, you have to change over to another, get a 10 bar instead. And if you get to 10, more than 10, 10 bars, you've got to go back to the bank and exchange it for, for 100. And so when you and I were in school, we used to call that carrying and borrowing in, in addition and multiplication and in subtraction and in division. So those are the fun collective exercises, lots of operations, learning the, the processes of when you divide, you start with the biggest number, you start with the thousands. When you divide, it has to be fair. So everybody has to get just the same amount. And then you might have a remainder and it's sensorial and it's the process and it's fun. And then the teacher knows to watch and see when is this child now beginning to make an abstraction with lots of repetition with those golden beads. They're probably in my mind, the most important math material. If you didn't have all the other beautiful materials, this is the most powerful. But once they know that those symbols and the processes for the operations, and they understand borrowing and exchanging or carrying, then they can go to a more abstract level. They go to this more symbolic 
um, representation, a tile for units. And then I don't know if you can see this, um, a represent representation of tens are now just the num numeral 10 on a tile and hundreds and thousands. And in this case, uh, they can write their own problems eventually. We love when they write their own problem much more than when the teacher has to do it. But in the beginning, the teacher will write the problem, an equation, 3,693 divided by three, and they have little skittles instead of their friends. Now they have a symbolic abstraction. These are kind of like people, and we're going to divide the thousands among the people, and then we're going to divide the hundreds, and everybody has, has to be fair, so everybody gets one. And then we write down the, um, the answer of the share of one skittle or one person, the way they used to do it with the beads. So abstraction is one step more abstract at a time. And parents, if you see your children, let me go back there, sorry. If you see your children coming home with this kind of paper, uh, the squared paper and there, there'll be equations written in here with decimals, um, don't worry if you see errors. Don't worry if there's in inaccurate counting or inaccurate subtraction. That's not the point of this work. The point of this work is the procedure, the process of where do you begin? What comes next? How do you keep your decimal places lined up? Um, how do you add? How do you subtract? What are the processes? So it's process, not product. Don't worry, they're not gonna memorize those big long mathematical problems. Where accuracy starts to come important is then when they move here. Now they're getting to abstraction to a point of where there's no beads and no tiles. So I'm hoping you can see this. I'm sorry again if it's a bit wobbly. Um, now they're using finger charts. And so if you can see there's a box of equations and we put all the equations in there and they cha we challenge them and they challenge themselves. How many do you think you could, you could do today? And they, how many of these equations can you find out the answer on this numeric chart Write down your answer on this paper. And when you know it, put it in the basket. And um, the teacher shows them how to correct their own work so that they're not dependent on the teacher. In the beginning, the teacher writes the equations, but then quickly they wanna move to write their own. And the same way for challenging themselves, they also correct themselves. So they can take their work when they're finished as many as they can do. And they come over to this chart and they can check their paper and check their answers and see what they got right. And then when they see the ones that were errors, they can correct their errors. And um, this kind of self-evaluation is built into all the material, but um, we learn from correcting our errors. So we don't want the teacher to do that. We want the child to do that. And we often use little symbols like this is, this is a heart basket. How many of these equations can you hold in your heart? Which is a beautiful kind of loving approach to memorization and they're kind of self testing themselves and, and um, self perfecting. So in a moment, uh, you'll see this process of going from the sensorial, then learning the language, learning, feeling this in your senses, holding it in your hands, building with it, creating with it. Then you get the language, the names that you need, the mathematical language, and then you work into procedures and concepts. So these are the metal insets, they're fractions, and they go from one whole to halves to thirds and so on up to tenths. They're very easily manipulated and held and compared and Karen um, Hannon DeWalt is going to show you the same mathematical procedure from sensorial to abstract with the fractions. So I'm complete here, I'm going to mute and go back to my office. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. What you should be looking at is the layout of the fraction material. Is that, is that what's, okay, good. Um, so Paula showed you what it looks like on the shelf, and this is what it looks like when they bring it to a table. And the beginning of fraction work is simply creating designs. So we might take out some insets from a couple of different fraction families And just have fun making designs with them. You can make funny things. That kind of looks like a scary face. Lots of different designs. So that's the introduction is just 
kind of playing with them and seeing and getting a feel for, you know, what they feel like, what the size of them is, how they relate to one another. Um, then we would show them, this is how you put them away. You're going to find the inset that matches this one. They're all going to be the same size. So these two match. Make sure they all match. So these two families of fractions are very different, so it's pretty obvious. But sometimes, like if you're comparing these two insects, it's pretty challenging to just visually tell. So you always want to check. Okay, so we put them back. So the that's the first step. It's just playing with them, rearranging them, making designs. The next step would be after a child has had lots of um, experience with making with pencil use and drawing and making metal insets, then they can put insets together on paper. And make designs on paper with colored pencils. So this is this is one that I made a long time ago. And that's really fun for children. So it's still kind of a sensorial activity, but also involves um, practicing their writing, exercising their writing muscles. More experience with the, with the uh, insects. And then next, we would introduce some of the language. So we tell them this is the whole. This is called, this one is called one. I don't know if you can see my label. I should have used a dark marker, but this says one. A fraction is part of the whole. So this one is the whole, this is part of the whole, and this is part of the whole. This is called a family, a fraction family. There are two parts, and this is the way you write the name of the family. The number two, and then there's a line above it. This family has three parts, one, two, three. This family is written with a three and a line above it. This is called the family of halves. This one is called the family of thirds. This family has four members. So I'm gonna put a line and a four underneath. This number underneath the line is called the denominator. D means under and nomen means number. The family name is written as the number under the line. So we introduce that language, the language of denominator and the names of the families. And then we would have them go ahead and label all of the fraction families here now that they know how to do that. Okay, so the next lesson would be introducing the numerator. So we're going to take out the family of fourths. I'm going to take out some members of the family of fourths. There are three members of the family of fourths here. This is how you can write that. That is three-fourths. The number on top is called the numerator. It tells you how many from that family. There's only one-fourth over here. Oops. That one is called one-fourth. So that's the next language lesson. They're experiencing it. If they want to, they could draw a design with this and they could label it. 
Okay, so that was numerator and denominator. The next activity with these fraction insets is called substitution. I'm going to put the family of fourths back. Okay, so you've had lots of practice with feeling these, moving them, creating designs. I wonder if there's another way. This is one half. You know that because you've practiced a lot. I wonder if there's another way to make one half. Hmm. Let's see if we can make one half with a family of thirds. No, it doesn't look like it. Let's see if we can make one half with a family of fourths. They look the same. They are the same. So one half and two fourths are the same. We can write that down. One half equals two fourths. And we can continue to explore. We would try the family of fifths and see if there's a way to make one half with the family of fifths and then the family of sixths. And they would discover that they would discover that two fourths and three sixths and four eighths and five tenths all make one half. So they're substituting and they're seeing the equivalency. So there's a lot to do with fractions. This is just the sensorial exploration and the language aspect of fractions. And um, so now Jane is going to be presenting how to do math operations with fractions. keeping in mind Karen's layout of fractions that she has. So a child who, for instance, we'll start with addition. So the child would lay out their fractions in the same formation. They would get a box of addition equations for fractions. And they would take a, a fraction out of the box. And it would be, for instance, four, six, plus one six. So when they see that it's the six family, they would bring down the six family and they would write down the equation on a piece of paper. Four six plus one six equals, them, and that would be left blank until they, they do the equation. So then they would get out of the fraction four, six, and then they would get out one six, and they would see when they count it all together, it would be five six. In the operations, we generally would remind them and ask them, what do you remember about addition? Oh, that's right. We put two numbers together to get a greater number. So that would be their reminder when they go to do that operation. Then if we do subtraction, they would once again lay out the formation of the fraction families and they would get out the subtraction box and they would get out an equation that might say six, six minus one, six. Then they would take their paper and they would write it six, six minus one, six and they would take out of the fraction family six, six, and then they would take one away, which then leaves five, six. So they're, they're now just moving those fractions as the equation tells them to do. With multiplication, um, we would 
talk to them about taking one number, the same number, so many times. And so they would get out. I'm just doing the family of six for all of them just to make it easier. They would take out of their multiplication box an equation that might say two six times two. And then they would write that equation out. Let's see if I can get that on the screen a little bit better for you. Two six times two. And then they would take out two six two times. And then they would add that all together and get out, would get the sum of four six. And then with division, we would use the Skittle that Paula had shown you with the stamp game. And we're gonna use those for division. So we take the division equation six, six divided by six, and then they would write that out, six, six divided by six. And they're going to take six Skittles out. And they know in division that you share equally. So they would give each Skittle one fraction. And their answer is found in what one fraction would get, which would be one six. And those would be the four operations of fractions. So I don't know if this is, would be the time that we would open this up, Paula, for questions perhaps, or I don't know what happened to everybody. <laughs> I don't see Paula responding, but this is the time when you can ask questions or share impressions. Sorry, I lost my mouse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, just any uh, thoughts, questions, ideas? Uh, we'll just open it up for conversation. Yes, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so for children's health, it, I guess the, the most advanced math that they learn in children's health is the kind of like the idea of fractions and adding and subtracting them and multiplying and dividing. Is that like the, that's like the peak, like the goal for children's health is to get them to there? Well, I'm so glad you said goal, Jennifer. Um, and that there's so many branches because actually the geometry work, oh my goodness, the geometric, the geometry language they're doing um, is another whole branch. Fractions was just one branch you can go down. It's like a great river and all these tributaries. Um, and so sometimes it's a child is really, really interested in all of the, the geometry work. And then they proceed to the, the furthest end of labeling all the angles in, in the geometry um, cabinet or all the triangles. Um, and not every child has to do that. And another child goes straight into the fraction stream and they just love that so much that they make it all the way to division with fractions. They can actually do division of fractions with a divisor, or with a fraction in the divisor. <laughs> so, you know, but we, it's not a goal that everybody must get there. It's just, it, we wanted to show the kind of scope of how far a child could go. Um, we certainly would say a goal for the end of the third year in Montessori, if you're typically you know, five or the equivalent of kindergarten, if you're in mainstream education, we would uh, really want them to be familiar with the operations with that golden bead material, understanding what division is and multiplication is and why you begin with units when you're adding and multiplying and you know, all those processes and principles. That would be a goal. And then we individualize if there's a child who's just not quite there yet because they're working on something else developmentally, you know, that's fine too. Because this same material, those STEM game materials are, are in the early elementary as well. So they can pick right up when they go into early elementary with these materials and then it gets more and more abstract. Uh, does that answer your question about goal versus how far we can go? Yeah, no, that does, thank you. Hi, I have a question about, Paula, you mentioned the stamp game. I know that that's something that Zachary's doing a lot of. 
in Karen's room right now. What um, math operations are taking place with the stamp game? Any guide can answer because we all have the same answer. I don't want it to be all my voice. So that would be, uh, we would do all four, to four operations. Um, not every child might get to division. I mean, hopefully they can get there, but you know, just like Paula was saying, there's, um, there's the opportunity to get that far if that's what you're ready for. But right now, um, so they start out with addition, then subtraction, multiplication, and division would be last. So they, again, they would be using those Skittles like Paula showed you to do the division. Multiplication, you're putting out the same number, uh, multiple numbers of times, whatever, you know, whatever your equation says. And all, all of the math operations with the stamp game begin with um, a more sensorial experience of it. So their experience with um, multiplication in, you know, four digit multiplication does not begin with um, the stamp game. It begins with that gold bead material. So they're seeing it in a more concrete way. And then the stamp game is a little bit more abstract because you're not seeing the actual quantity of 100, you're just seeing a stamp that represents 100. But you know so well from the from the gold bead material what a hundred is that you can now make that abstraction. Does that answer your question, Elizabeth? It does. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I just wanted to also say the the one wonderful thing about the decimal game is they get to see if they have ten of one category they need to exchange. For instance, if they had 10 units, they have to stop. And we actually have something called the bank and they go and they would exchange those 10 units and bring back a 10, a golden uh, bar um, so that they see the exchanging process. And that helps them immensely when they do do the stamp game because they'll think in their head, oh, that's right, I have 10. I remember going and walking across the room to exchange. And I think it becomes much more concrete uh, to them than when they are on that stamp game. And I'll sometimes even say, if they're having difficulty remembering, remember, you know, you were at the bank and you need to, to stop and exchange. So I find playing those decimal games are so very important, even over the stamp game. <laughs> you know, sometimes. Thank you. Corey? Hi. Um, so I have a four-year-old. She's not at Hershey. So but we're doing some homeschooling. Um, and I'm a parent infant now. So Tierney recommended I join this. So I guess my question, um, since we don't have the advantage of having a multi-child environment where, you know, you're seeing other children work on materials and kind of learning from them and um, maybe getting motivation to do, you know, a next material from a, a fellow classmate, I guess is how do you have, continue the motivation to go on to like, you know, to master one material and go on to the next, or is that kind of like an innate thing to just kind of rely on their inner drive to do, or is there a way you can motivate it? Well, I think any parent can join join us in coming up with ideas that have worked in their households. Um, uh, things that come up for me with math in the home are that it's a passion and a love and that you're smiling and loving it too. If you have a stress memory about math, that's going to come out in your body. <laughs> and if you're giving it more weight than art or music or any other human discipline, um, it might start to make it feel less fun and, and more pressured. So I'd start with, is this interesting or is it lovely or is it fun? And fun doesn't mean everything has to be a circus, but, but, um, but kind of it has that feeling. So the child's going to want to stay with sort of math puzzles and math challenges and, and even the words we use at home, like we'll say, oh, math, is, this is a hard one. And sometimes that isn't a great inspiration. So you might say, this is really interesting. You know, I wonder, can we solve this problem? And rather than using words like hard and too hard. <laughs> um, 
So those are little things that might be helping. You know, is it fun? Are you loving it? Is it making you smile? And then integrating um, mathematical concepts. Remember orientation, order, sequencing, um, sorting silverware from the dishwasher into a silverware container for a small child. That's mathematical work. Picking out, finding all the spoons and they go in that slot and finding all the forks go in this slot. That's sorting, ordering and categorizing. Um, and, and it's also loose quantity. So eventually you could say, well, how many knives did we have? I thought we lost one. Count how many knives are in the knife slot? How many forks are in the fork slot? Um, and it's purposeful and it's real and it has meaning because everybody in the family is interested in those things. Um, of course, like um, jump roping. Let, I wonder how many times we can jump. Let's you know, jump rope to 10. Um, and then eventually when they're ready to start skip counting, let's jump rope by twos. Two, four, six, eight. Another one might be um, hopscotch, but maybe not going all the way to 10. When Jane mentioned it, walking with your body, like whole body learning, moving with your scent, not all just pencil and paper, um, but you can have fun with moving in your whole body and you're teaching the numerals one, two, three. And maybe that's all your hopscotch says is one, two, three. Um, we generally like, do th things in threes. It's an easy way to sort of teach the name of something or the word of a concept in uh, three and then practice it and experience it and hold it or jump on it or walk with it lots of time repeating that one two three and then eventually you can ask them what is it that's the final test but in the beginning it's just recognizing it we call this a three period lesson you give the names and the language of something and then they recognize it by playing with it or practicing on it and then eventually they can tell you back what it is but um, so hopscotch teaching numerals uh i don't know what comes up for anyone else Uh, I know at our house, a big thing is measuring things. So taking a ruler and measuring things or even just their own height and comparing comparing that, that's, that's something that we have a lot of fun with at home. That's great. Uh, Any other suggest, ideas, anybody? I would Sorry. suggest baking because you can work with fractions. Um, and then you get to, you know, eat the product that you made. So it always is fun. If we can think of math as expression, instead of something that was really hard for us and we got tested in, <laughs> But if we think of it as expression, like it's language, it's, it's an expression of quantity, it's an expression of geometric shape, it's an expression of things, and you can express these ideas, and um, you can give me a part of that expression, and I can guess the next part, I can solve your puzzle, your solution. Um, it, if we kind of change our mindset into these are curious puzzles we can solve or the, with those fractions what's really neat is you, we talk about them we name them we're using our mouth and our words now I'm going to say nothing I'm going to write this code down let's see can you guess it and I'm not saying any words and it's like the magic of the power of writing that I can express my idea about fractions to you and I'm not even going to say a word you know and so that might draw their interest into well I'd like to write something down without saying a word I wonder if I could just make a quick comment, if that's okay. <laughs> um, Paula and, and uh, Karen and Jane, thank you so much. It was excellent. But um, my son, when he was uh, in uh, Children's House, he absolutely loved the stamp game. And I think, and he's four, almost 40 years old now, <laughs> but I just want to say how this has affected him if you don't think that this they don't carry this with them throughout their lives you know um he i think that's right where it clicked with, for him was the stamp game and he couldn't get enough of it and uh he just kept going and going and going with it um and to this day everything he does he counts in tens and he can do math in his head in an instant 
and just have it, you know, and he said, oh, I just, you know, did this by tens and then, you know, whatever was re remainder, that's the end of it, you know. But I know that's where it came from and it has stuck with him for his entire life. And he has a wonderful love of math too, so. That's it. Entirely. Jennifer, I saw you had your hand up. Um, I was just wondering about like logic. I know, I think you might've mentioned like puzzles a little bit, but like, are there other uh, materials that you use in the classroom for like introducing the idea of logic? Oh, can I take this one? I'm going to grab something off the shelf. <laughs> so, so happy you asked that question. And okay, if anyone doesn't know, Jennifer Sneed is a parent at Hershey of two children, but she also is the math teacher at the uh, high school. So she has this vested curiosity. And she sees what, what it can look like at the other end for the children that were lifers. So deductive reasoning is one way of reasoning logic. And these, these are sound boxes. And each cylinder has a very distinct gradation of loud to soft. But you really have to listen carefully. And um, so we're going to, and there's a matching one that's blue. And there's six of them. So we're going to take this and we're going to, in my, in our scientific world, we'd call this the control. And sometimes we can use that word. Here's the control. We're going to listen to this sound. And now we're going to go systematically through six of these, one at a time. Not the same. You put it down, you get another one. Listen to the control again. Mm, not quite the same. Put that down, put it to the back. There's an order, a sequence to this. Now listen to the control again and try another one. They might be the same. And, and then you go back and start another one. Now here's a new control and then you go back. So it's deductive reasoning. If not this, put it to the back, try the next one. If not this, try the next one. And then at the bottom, there's a control of error where my sticker fell off. The teachers gave me the duds because the better quality ones go in the classroom. Um, but there would be two stickers at the bottom, maybe color coded or something. And so when they've used their ears and deductive reasoning six times to find all the very fine differences and match them together, then they can check their own work and see if they're the same. They can check first by listening and then they can check underneath. So we build in control of error. So you check something, you have a control, you're deductive systematic, try this, try this, try this. And then how do you check? Is this correct? Does this equation balance? You know, so that's just one place for deductive reasoning. Um, what else did you ask? Say the other word you used, Jennifer. Can I add on to that, Paula? Go ahead, Karen. Yeah. So I think of um, I think of reasoning and logic in in all the aspects of of the environment, starting from practical life of laying things out in a particular order and doing things. You know, the most of the practical life activities have a certain sequence. That they must follow. Like you're, if you're scrubbing a table, you know you have to get the water first. If you get, if you try to scrub the table without any water and without any soap, you know you're not going to dry the table first. You're going to scrub it, wipe it, wipe out the soap, and then dry it. So, and you see children stopping in the midst of, you know, what they're doing. Like they realize, oh, that doesn't come first. I need to do this first, and they'll go back. And so that's where they start building. I think a practical life is where they start building that logic of, oh, that doesn't make sense. If I dry this table, but it's already dry, that doesn't make any sense. Um, also uh, in language, in fact, there were children doing um, some grammar work today. And one, and one of the aspects of the grammar work is to like say they're working with, um, the adjective lesson, and it would be a phrase like the black cow. And after they've symbolized it with their grammar symbols, the next thing they would do is rearrange all the words. Okay, then they would read black a cow or cow black a, and they think about, okay, what that doesn't make sense. And it's really fun. You know, they're giggling and you know, that doesn't make sense. What makes sense? And they try all these different ways and they say, okay, well, it only makes sense when you do it this way. So there's lots of different, um, you know, and as Paula was showing you in the sensorial area, there's, there's matching, there's grading, all of that builds your uh, logical uh, 
deductive mind. Jennifer, you also asked about, you know, how, what, when we talked about branches and how far can you go? <laughs> um, there are two things I didn't mention. And I mentioned, we did the fractions as one example, and then I mentioned geometry. Um, I love listening to ninth grade geometry class because all the language that I hear in the Euclidean text when the children are using original Euclidean text or just other text is the same language they're hearing at three to six in sensorial with the geometry materials. Um, and you'll hear us using words like superimpose and congruent and the base and the angle, and, you know, the height. Um, but the other place we do is a memorization of math facts. I wanted to make a mention of that for our parents here. Um, again, it's not a goal that every child has to get there. And if they don't, they failed <laughs> or there's something wrong with them. But we have that scope and sequence to get to memorization. And that's where accuracy does count when you start to see math memorization papers coming home. We want those to be accurate. Um, and we also get into um, the uh, hierarchical material where we, when they're really familiar with abstraction in the decimal system, then they can go into experiencing what a million is like relative to a unit. And their sensorial material, it's so big, it's a giant big box and it's really hard to carry. You might have to get a friend to carry it with you because a million is big relative to who's carrying the little unit. Um, and we share those usually between elementary and early out. So they have to go down the hall and kind of go on a field trip to get the hierarchical material and then have a real sensorial impression of walking all the way down the hall together, carrying a million and then carrying a hundred thousand and then going back and carrying the tens of thousands and then labeling them all and seeing how many zeros, how many placeholders there are. So, you know, that's another stream you can go down in math. But in memorization, um, it's, it's an interesting topic for all of us as adults. And, um, you know, you saw the finger charts there. That's one way of getting into memorization. But we have those bead chains where they get into skip counting and making squares of number and cubes of number with those long bead chains. They count by twos or threes or fours all the way through by tens. And, um, and with that, uh, th that is an indirect preparation for memorization of your math facts. Because if you can count the labels and you count label five and 10 and 15 and 20, and then we can quit, you know, as they get better at it and repeat it a lot, we can up the challenge. You wanna wear a blindfold and see how many of those labels you remember? Or do you wanna put your back to it and have a friend go and walk along and read, and read the labels and you can recite them and see if your friend finds all the ones that you recited. Like we're just little challenges for memorization, but it's not a, a requirement. You know, we just have built in lots of opportunity to keep upping the ante. Um, and um, we do know that there's a kind of a sensitive period or a critical time in the psychology and the development of the mathematical mind for memorization, for that abstraction and memorization. Um, and it's usually between the ages of five and seven and a half, five and eight years of age. Um, and that's the kind of the most proficient time, the easiest time for them to just absorb those facts. Um, after that, it doesn't mean like, oh, you'll never get it. It just means you learn more systematic ways of memorizing your math facts. You learn to identify, maybe I'll just learn the essential ones and I have to do work a little more with repetition to, to have recall. And some minds, some amazing mathematical minds never actually are fluid with their math facts. I'm one of them. I love advanced math, <laughs> right? Um, I read about math, but every time you ask me seven times seven, I'm going to have to use my little strategies in my brain. And I'm so, they're so fast now, but it's not fluid recall, but it doesn't mean that I don't have a mathematical mind. It's just my wiring, <laughs> right? So not everybody is going to be, and I wonder of all of us in this room tonight, there's 17 of us here, how many of us have created little shortcuts to try remember your math facts versus how many of you can just, you know, if I woke you up in the middle of the night and said seven times seven, how many would you have it? And, so, and it's no shame. And it doesn't mean you're bad at math. It's just that one particular skill, your wiring works differently for that. It's a bit like reading. Some children are whole readers, some are real phonetic readers, but we all read. But I just wanted you to know that our aim is to give them enough exposure to different mathematical concepts and repetition. Um, in ways that are loving and not forced and mandated. If you notice, our papers are blank, a lot of them. Not that equations are prepared so that they can get their own equations, not need an adult. But um, when they're writing out their own math, we use a lot of blank paper, or squared paper that doesn't, you know, long rolls of paper. So we're not just saying you must do 10. 
you must do five, right? That's us kind of limiting even the value and the joy out of the work. Um, it's like, oh, great, I'm done. If I get through five, I can go into something else I might love. And it's like, no, we love this. How many can you do? Do you think you'll fill that whole role? How far can you go? And the, the more we keep doing that open-ended, if worksheets, you just fill in the blanks on the worksheet and then it's done. We kind of set up the environment and the materials so that it's not just fill in the blanks and you're done, but how much further can you go? Like, how many chains can you connect down the hallway? You know, once you get to six and seven, we can really start getting them to be imaginative and constantly challenging them to do more and repeat more. And then that memorization starts to happen more um, just effortlessly. So I don't know if anyone else has questions about memorization or if you're all comfortable with um, the fact that if you don't have speed recall, it, and I bet you all made it through college and you all <laughs> have mathematical minds, um, but our aim for those who are able, our aim is to, is to have them memorized by seven and a half, eight. So we'll all get there at the same time. That's okay. I, I just wanted to share that the Montessori materials are so much fun to work with. They're so hands-on, so delightful, so inviting. And what I experience from children is how delighted they are to work with them. And they love math. They just love to count. Um, they feed off of each other and um, they find joy in it. Um, they just love to count. <laughs> so that's the beauty of the environment, I think, is the materials. So it, it's exciting. It's fun. If we think of what Dr. Montessori described in those human tendencies, the psychology of humans, it's all about independence. How do I explore my environment? So infants are born with these drives. So in parent-infant, you can see it. They're, they're born with these drives to, for independence. Um, let me explore this. I want to know more about this. And it's that human drive to explore the world. And thanks to that human interest in order, and it's, it, it's, it's a sensitive period in infants, they, they need this order to orient to their world. And, um, and the temporal order, the beginning, first you do this when you're changing me, and then we do this, and then we do that, and they understand the order of that. And then they don't have to worry about changing. It's not so tearful anymore because they understand it. They've oriented to it. Then the order of where things are in the house, and where do shoes go, and the order of how we eat at the table. And it becomes uh, less confusing you know, to test boundaries because they know this order is there. Well, that order is a mathematical mind. It's us orienting to our world. And so language is also a human tendency, right? And so that's us naming the concepts and the things we're imagining in our minds and um, the concepts that we can see and hold in our senses and in our bodies, but also the concepts that we have now held in our hearts. Remember the memorization and how many can you hold in your heart? Um, that language um, is, is a part of mathematical mind and it allows you to express and it allows you to um, problem solve in order to be independent in your environment, to create upon or within your environment. So if I need to build a house, if I need to hunt animals for food, I need to have orientation and order. I need to have assistance to build this fire. And it gives me independence that allows me to thrive. And humans have this constant urge to keep self-perfecting and creating a new and finding new efficiencies. And all of that is that um, the underlying psychology of mathematical thinking. And I'm glad Karen mentioned the practical life, like just doing for oneself and remembering what comes first and then what do I have to do? And then how do I problem solve this? Um, it's more um, just being human and uh, tools that help you create within your environment and be more independent within it. In the elementary, oh, go ahead, Karen, go ahead. I was just thinking about the children getting ready for going outside to play and <laughs> thinking about order and, you know, sequence of activity you know, inevitably somebody has their coat on, their boots on, and, and then they realize, oh, I forgot to put my snow pants on. Then they have to take everything off to put their snow pants on. And, you know, like you, they're, and eventually 
they get the rhythm of, you know, I know what goes first, I know what goes next, I know what goes next, but it's, you know, it's important practice. And it's, it's really, you know, we don't, we try not to be involved too much and, you know, step back, we might give some reminders, you know, if they're heading out the door and they don't have their snow pants on, we might say, oh, you know, I see you don't have your snow pants on. Um, or we might say, you know, if you put your gloves on before you zip up your coat, it's going to be really hard to zip your coat. But eventually, you know, through practice and practice and practice, they realize, you know, it's, it starts becoming part of who they are embedded in their bodies. But, you know, it's kind of like a daily funny thing to watch, you know, <laughs> what they're building in their brains. They're problem solving and we're not giving them the answers. We're not doing it for them. We're not fixing it for them. We might ask guiding questions. Oh, I wonder, did you notice something about your boots? Um, and then we get, we have all day. We're not in a rush here, right? So we have all day for them to problem solve and figure that out for themselves. The more we do for them, the more we tell them what to do and problem solve for them. Um, they're missing the opportunities to be confident problem solvers themselves. That's brilliant, Karen. And the other thing I was going to say about um, math as a mindset and a love and a human expression um, and a step to independence. Uh, in the elementary, we don't mandate homework. But I say to when I interview new parents coming in and they're older, children are older, and I'm telling them the things that might surprise them about Montessori, and that's always one on my list. And I say, it's not that we don't ask elementary students to do homework. We do. Their homework is build a treehouse, get your measurements, get your tools, you know, and apply mathematical thinking and your body to do something purposeful that's challenging. Um, there's lots of problem solving with building a treehouse or building a ladder. Let them start with just ladders and, um, and real nails and real hammers. You just show them how to be safe with them. Um, and um, homework in the elementary is um, do your own laundry. You came home with those muddy sweatpants, snow, snow pants or whatever from outside. Um, you can do for yourself. How else, what can you do for our family? You can, you can take on a chore for cooking. I'm gonna do this part, you can do that part. So problem solving, and any opportunity for independence is their homework. Um, and then if they love math puzzles and you found some great games at home, that's wonderful too, but it, 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 we don't wanna separate learning as some chore that must be done when you're most tired <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, we want most of their energy and that new concepts to happen when they're in the classroom. Well, I see the time is 9.02. I think it's, uh, it's been a fun night tonight with you. And uh, thank you for bearing with us as we were experimenting with using docu cameras and all of that. And the teachers took home materials to present to you from their homes. And, but it's late and they have to be in the classroom tomorrow morning. I'd like to let them go. Any, any parting thought anybody would like to give the teachers or? Thank you all time? for all the preparations and for being up so late with us. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful <laughs> to see it all. Thank you for staying up late to join us. Thank you, have a good night.